Okay, just let me do a quick refresh mm -hmm. just to make sure that everything is okay. Yep. Is it live on your side? It says live on Facebook. Yeah, I see. Woohoo! Okay. Mm. Hold on now. It's lagging on my side. Sure. Okay. Hello, Let's parents. Move. This is Ko John here from Learning Out of the Box. And thanks so much for coming back again for the second session for today. And today I have the privilege of having a good friend of mine, and his name is Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Hi, hi, John. Thanks for having me. Yes, and the reason why mm. I brought Daniel up is because uh, he is a very pa passionate te uh, teacher. And today, he's going to share with us scoring full marks for comprehension open-ended. And I think it comes in timely for many of the PSLE kids uh, who are going to sit for their big battle in one month plus time, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, Daniel, would you be able to share with us like um, your backstory and actually how you ended up doing what you love today? Yeah, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks again, John. Uh, I, I think John is doing amazing things. Uh, whatever he's doing, it's for the benefit of all these uh, parents. So that's why I try to put um, a, a time slot to, to support him through this, uh, through this platform. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks so because much. I think our schedule is always quite packed, especially we have so many P6 students. Okay. So a quick story about me, I started off um, teaching in, um, in an MOE school. So I was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And then um, right after I joined the school, um, that school happens to be a GEP center, gifted education program. Mm. So there are eight GEP centers there. So uh, right after I started teaching, my principal um, wanted me to transfer into the GEP department to teach in the gifted education program. So I went for this 10 month course in NIE. Um, it's a part-time course. So after work, I would go there. I remember it was a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> I'll go there for three hours wow. uh, for a span of 10 months. So basically that was a good opportunity for me to absorb all the teaching pedagogy, how to support gifted children, uh, um, high ability kids and so on. Um, so it was an eye-opener. But after 10 months, at the end of the year, my principal changed her mind. She decided not to... Uh, or Actually, she just threw a spanner in the works. She asked me to become HOD for pupil development. Um, at that time, I think it is the equivalent of what you call CCE HOD, the Character and Citizenship Education HOD. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's um, discipline, master, um, taking care of prefects, uh, pastoral care, special needs, CIP, national education, social studies. Wow, partners, so, so many portrait, things. Including, including dealing with pandemics. So I remember I was doing the H1N1, the entire operations with my OM. But um, long story short, um, for a second year teacher to do two transitions in my third year was a bit too daunting. So I told her, can I do multiple choice? Uh, can I, I have more passion <laughs> for, the, for the pastoral care side. So I did the HOD mm. job and eventually I didn't go into the GEP to teach, but I was always deployed to teach in the top classes in mm -hmm. uh, P4, P5 and P6. Uh. So uh, that's my uh, growing journey in terms of uh, my development of my craft as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So applying all the, you know, the so-called GEP techniques into the mainstream class has uh, brought about quite a lot of uh, fruits, uh, a lot of uh, interesting things that I could do with the students, especially when they are very high functioning, uh, uh, very uh, high ability and very motivated. So I was able to do a lot of things with them. And um, thankfully, a lot of it happened to tram transfer into results, uh, transfer into results for the students. So um, they managed to earn uh, very, very strong uh, results for their PSLE. Uh. So I remember my first year, that P6 class, oh, 44 students, um, 36 had A star for English and uh, 42 had A star for math. Uh, so I, I think uh, kudos to them. I, I, I basically, I did the same for all my classes, right? So I didn't like specially teach the top class this thing and then the, the average class the other thing. I taught them all the same things. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course, the top class uh, managed to, to uh, uh, you know, do, do well for themselves. So after that, I got a bit restless in the ministry because eventually I was offered to, um, to consider going for my uh, vice principal, uh, you know, the whole process. Then I reflected on it. I, I thought the higher you go, so-called higher you go, uh, of course, it's always a change of function, not necessarily high or low, was that you end up leaving the classroom eventually. You know, so the principal and the vice principals, they don't really have that opportunity, that much classroom opportunity. So I decided maybe that was not why I signed up for this. So I decided to take a break and uh, went to do my PhD in history. I've always been a history major. 
in Europe. Wow. So I decided to do a history on the Vietnam War and uh, Singapore-US foreign relations. So I was in Australia for four years. Uh, I came back and then um, went to uh, NIE first. So I became an NIE lecturer, uh, teaching, training, uh, social studies teachers. So I was teaching uh, PGDE courses uh, for, for a while. Then after that, I found another position in still within NTU because NIE is within NTU. So after doing teacher training, um, I decided to switch over to security. So I was doing RS, doing some security related South China Sea politics uh, in uh, RSIS. Yeah, so that one is a security school within NTU. Mm. Uh, I'm still teaching there actually. Um, so twice a year, I'll be back to teach um, Cold War history and uh, international history, China history, that kind of thing. Um, so meanwhile, my full time is I'm running my center. So I decided to leave the to leave um, academia, um, I think about three three years back, yeah, because um, the the so called the hook for me was basically to support my own kids. Uh, we my wife and I we choose to homeschool, so oh. we are supporting our children uh, at home also, and uh, being able to understand the current curriculum and knowing what's going on, I I think uh, that that uh, helps me with my own children. Uh, so ultimately, I decided to go into um, enrichment and tuition. Uh, initially, we wanted to to do the the JC, the GP uh, side. Then later on, because of chance, I have a friend who wants me to teach his primary school <laughs> uh, child. Mm-hmm. Then we then started doing that, and yeah, then in the end, we are doing the whole spectrum from primary to JC English. Um, so a lot of what I've done in the past somehow dovetail into what I am doing right now for my students. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I still enjoy teaching. So mm-hmm. it's really something which I, I want to help them. I also feel that there are a lot of things which I can offer, uh, at least to share with them some, sometimes not, in fact, a lot of the things that I teach, I always have to confess to parents, they're not quick tips. Uh, the quick tips are easy to find. I think there are a lot of teachers with, um, you know, very, uh, very, simple tips. Um, what I really do is go deep into critical uh, reading and critical writing, which is why um, this whole, you know, gifted education method, right, isn't just, um, you know, telling you five steps, but there are a lot of rigor. In the end, I always tell parents I'm using English as an excuse to teach them critical thinking. Hmm. Because whatever they learn, uh, it, can, it can help them uh, all the way, even until... Um, uh, undergraduate and masters, you know, because I'm I'm still teaching an English course in NTU for masters students who, who need writing skills. They currently, um, they have business background or they have computing background, but now they are doing a master's degree on politics and and international relations. So they need to write five thousand word essays, and they are very <laughs> worried. So I need to teach them how to break it down and then structure and eventually. Uh, write in a credible way um, so that they can earn their uh, masters and you know their bachelor degrees. Uh. Can okay, I so that's about get, me. Mm. Cha, can I just get get you to share because I and I and I think I and I caught a few tips. Uh, like I mean a few groups of tips. One is the quick tip. The other one is the GP tips. Plus also, mm. I think the third one that you want to go deeper is the the uh, related to critical thinking. Yeah, so I think because I think uh, there are many parents who, are, who also teach our children at home and we're not exposed to all these different uh, categories. Yeah, so mm-hmm. could you share with us like help us to better understand what are some, some, some examples of quick tips then you can share with us like the GP um, techniques that, that you still follow right now. Mm, okay, um, mm-hmm. so let me start with the first part of your question which is Yes. Um, how that links with uh, what's the difference between a quick tip and uh, what I call a more rigorous kind of um, a deep root kind of uh, um, tips right or techniques. Um, essentially, whatever I applied, now we got to understand that the gifted education program is a very robust program with endless possibilities in what kind of methods they use. You know, they, they, are, they are able to apply any um, method into the program to help every child and every GEP student um, has their unique way of learning. So the teacher will try to cater to their unique ways. Uh, so what I've drawn out from my course then is the distilled version, the, the most applicable in a big classroom setting um, for 
both mainstream and um, high function, high ability children. Mm -hmm. So I summarize what is in this particular theory called critical thinking. So if you are interested, you can go to criticalthinking.org. Uh, so that's literally the website. Um, so it's a couple of American education psychologists. They came up with the idea of how we teach critical thinking. Now, we know that we, if we try to teach creativity, it will be a very uncreative way and probably it will backfire. So critical thinking is, they, they, they don't presume to have steps, but it is a lot of um, an understanding of the different levels um, that need to uh, that need to be achieved in order to demonstrate critical thinking. At the end of the day, um, the outcome is you know a student who can ask vital questions, a student who can solve problems, being resourceful, a student who is able to communicate their solutions also. So this all comes in. It can be very generic. Um, so when I say going deep, it's it's basically telling them certain principles, and going through the practices with them. They won't get it the first time, second time, up to the 10th time, they're starting to see it. And then finally they master it, um, you know, over a course of uh, maybe five to six weeks, as opposed to, um, I have this type of question, for example, um, synthesis and transformation, right? So it's very common for, for some teachers to teach them, here are the things you need to do to check your answers. You know, you have your tensors, then you have your SBA. So these are so-called quick tips where uh, in the exam situation, if you apply them, uh, you can minimize your careless mistakes. Or if you, um, you know, it's, it's basically self-checking, so it can be a process. Uh, so quick tips are something which you can tell any child, apply in tomorrow's worksheet. Mm -hmm. You can um, basically see some results right away. However, um, quick tips are not able to, they, they do not have the depth and they do not have the breadth to be able to handle outliers, to be able to handle irregular uh, situations like a different context or a different comprehension text, for example. So if we hover around quick tips, chances are um, they, will, they will still be hampered by their potential. So if their potential is not very high, right? Of course, we know all children are different. So if their potential is not very high, the tips will only help them this much. But if they work on their potential instead, and then they have the tips, uh, then they can go further. Yeah. So um, that's, but to the, to the students, I seldom talk in, in these terms because it's not helpful to them. Yeah. <laughs> Basically just teach them and then uh, get them to practice, get them to believe in the system because after a while they get tired when they apply and they always can't get it. And some say that, oh, you know, following your method, it seems to, it, it seems to even, you know, uh, backfire, right? So, but after I show them that, you know, the value is in now you have a method, mm -hmm. you know that you're following a process. Yes, you don't get full marks yet, but you know you can tweak the process, get better at using the process, and you see yourself visibly improving. Uh, then that, <laughs> that's consistent. Then you can replicate success. A lot of them are successful sometimes because they are lucky um, and we cannot replicate luck. We need to be able to have a method to, to develop that, that consistency. Um, so having deep, uh, roots in critical think, critical reading and critical writing I find is more sustainable especially mm -hmm. when the jump from primary 6 to set 1, oh that, that's uh, a, a big jump, a lot of them who kind of hobble through PSLE, oh I managed to you know, get a B or a low A but the moment they go to secondary school they realise wow everything is so different mm -hmm. um, that's because it's of course the subject has a different context, um, different exam format and different requirements but um, I find it a shame that they have the time in the first six years of their education to develop these thinking skills, but it was always about how to handle and how to handle exams. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit sad. Lah. But um, today I plan to uh, talk about comprehension open-ended because it is one of those ways which uh, if they have that critical reading uh, method, it will help them in a lot of different uh, sections as well. So I'm hoping that to be able to... Uh, to at least uh, equip some of your your uh, your community. Great. Yeah. Probably. Uh. Maybe next next time when when you're free, then we can come on. You can come on board for just maybe a a, a full day workshop by Daniel on critical thinking for adults. Sure. Sure. Uh, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> <We can. laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there are many parents uh, who are already uh in the Facebook live. I think we touch on 
why they are here. I think they also want to know, uh, like, like, like what you say, probably now we are more focused on PSLE since it's coming. Yeah. yeah. And we ended our questions for English paper. Mm. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, let me, let me make you co-host first, uh, just in case you need to do any screen share. Or... Yep. Mm. Can I share screen now? Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead, please mm, go ahead. Okay. So I just did. So now I just, okay, I want to make sure that you can see. Okay. I, you know, I understand that um, after using Zoom for a while and even attending some, some other person's Zoom sessions, that sometimes um, there can be some lag. So I'll try to speak a bit slower um, so that in case uh, there are you know, uh, parents whose, whose uh, connection may not be very consistent, at least uh, you, can, you can hear me clearly. If you need me to repeat any part of it, I'm happy to do so. Just um, drop uh, John a, a note. I think uh, I'll be able to repeat that. Yes. I think uh, it's if important. If parents have any question, I will pick it up from the Facebook uh, mm. and, and then I will, I'll post it in the Zoom chat. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So I think some context first for comprehension open-ended. This current format uh, is, uh, was introduced in 2015. So in 2015, uh, there is a change of the exam paper format. So there is, uh, I won't go into details, but essentially the impact on comprehension open-ended is the types of questions. So we now have true false questions, um, usually two or three marks, usually three marks, where there is um, a statement, then the child has to identify if it's true or false, and then give a reason why it is true or false. Yeah. So both parts have to be, the, to, to be correct in order for them to earn one mark for each question. Then um, there are also referencing questions and also sequencing questions as well as um, cause and effect questions. So these are the new question types for comprehension open-ended starting from 2015. Now, if some parents still have the 2015 past PSLE exam, you notice that the papers tend to be a little bit um, unbalanced. Some schools have it very tough. Some have it very easy. The reason is that was the first year and nobody really has any so-called clear benchmark. So subsequently, I think we see the standards of the papers um, becoming more consistent. I think it's a good thing. Um, in general, it is actually simpler right, than previous. right? Uh, but again, that's just a generalization. Uh, and for every child, they can see it very differently. Now, two mark questions and one mark questions have not changed, um, except that now, after 2015, students will not lose any marks if they have missing punctuation, if they have mis uh, as mistakes in grammar and spelling, right? So it used to be a, a, a point for deduction uh, of marks, but uh, the 2015 uh, new format uh, no longer penalizes students for errors in grammar, uh, punctuation and spelling in comprehension. The reason is they have added another five MCQ questions in booklet A for grammar. They've added another two items for editing. Um, so seeing that they are testing grammar explicitly, they have decided not to create a double jeopardy for students who are weak in grammar, but strong in comprehension because they want this section to test students on comprehension, hmm. not grammar, right? Hmm. Uh, so short of having an oral questioning with the student, right? Uh, do you understand this passage? And then ask you questions. Short of doing that, they have decided to kind of overlook the, the errors in uh, grammar, vocab, and all, uh, grammar and spelling in comprehension OE. So this is something that is new. However, schools will still prefer to, to penalize students for grammatical errors because it, I'm an English teacher. Uh, you want your child, you want the students to, to learn proper uh, sentence structure and all that. So, so that is the change, uh, which means overall students will be able to actually perform better uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to comprehension open ended in general, if they understand the passage, yeah. So just now I mentioned uh, earlier about the gifted ed the, how the GEP method and so on, and about critical reading and critical writing. So this is distilled from the website that I mentioned, critical thinking. Now, basically, criticalthinking.org is a massive full program, um, and I'm just 
taking less than, I would say, 10% of what they're doing by applying it into language learning because they do a lot of other things. Yeah. Uh, so focusing on English, right? Um, the main things I, I want to always emphasize is there are five levels of critical reading. How does a child know if um, she or he is a good reader, competent reader, right? They wouldn't know unless, uh, because the fact that we don't know, we don't know what we don't know. So they all kind of feel that if they can finish reading very quickly, that means they are good readers, but it's not so simple. They can read every word, but still not understand the context. So there are five levels very quickly. Um, first level is paraphrasing, being able to repeat to another person what you just read. Second level is identifying main ideas. Now, it's not good to always just repeat everything. You need to be able to identify the main idea and summarize your message in one or two sentences, right? So if you have very young kids, you will know. Uh, if you ask them about their day, they will tell you every single <laughs> detail. But if you just distill it in us and, and tell them, can you tell me what was the happy thing that happened or what was the thing that you, know, you feel a bit sad about? Ah, then they will tell you the main idea, right? So they see this transformation starting from maybe before P1, P2, and then maybe during P1, P2, they need to learn how to identify main ideas. Some will take a bit longer. Now, the third level is the main part that I want to focus on, which is analyzing text logic. So after they have identified the main idea, they need to understand why the feeling, why the, the characters in the, in the passage may feel in a certain way, or by looking at their speech, they can infer how they are feeling, what they want to do, or by looking at their actions to know how they are feeling. So they need to be able to understand the reasoning behind the text. So it's all about context. Yeah. Now the rest I don't uh, want to focus on today because it doesn't apply so much to primary six. Those are more for my secondary and my JC kids. Yeah. So analyzing text logic. Now at this point, it feels very abstract. In fact, when I first learned this, it was very abstract. How do I apply it in a P4, P5 and P6 classroom, right? Uh, and comprehension. Now in order to make it into a, a practicable um, strategy, I, I do this in my class, right? So if you don't understand what you're reading, you won't be able to answer the question. So you must be able to do both, answer, uh, read and understand the passage and answer according to what the requirements are. So the first step is critical. Reading is, is critical. If you don't understand what you're reading, nothing happens, okay? Now, so how do you read critically? What I do in my classroom is I will chunk my passage into paragraphs mm -hmm. or sometimes group a few short paragraphs together. Then I get students to read. After each paragraph, I like to ask them to dive into the passage. They're in such a hurry to keep reading, but I want them to hold back and read and, and think. Thinking, slowing down to think is time well spent, right? So I ask them, I'll ask them, what is happening here? Then they describe to me the context. Oh, you know, this character is doing this. What is the main idea of this passage or this paragraph? Now, even without telling me, even without reading the rest of the passage, I need them to predict what this passage is about and even tell me the conclusion or what will happen. So how does this connect with the previous paragraphs? So if this is the second, third paragraph, how does it connect? And what do you think will happen next? So by asking them all these questions, I am giving them a stake in the development of the story. Now they are involved. Now, when you're involved in something, have you ever tried looking for something in your drawer or in your room? Because you want to find that one thing, you look harder. <laughs> you start to notice what's in the drawer. Mm. So I want the students to have a stick in the passage and they will then look harder because they know how to read every word, but they don't understand the passage, right? So that's the scary part. So being able to read, pause, ask questions, reflect. I also ask them to, to read using, to hold a pencil when they're reading so that they're scribbling notes uh, at the side um, sometimes for a starter, for a beginner, um, the notes can be, I don't understand. They can write down. Mm. By interacting with the text, it opens up their, their engagement because they are so distanced from the text. They just want to read to answer the questions. It is too efficient to make an impact. So I would ask them to slow down and scribble some notes. Tell me how you feel about this passage, right? And by the way, all comprehension close, uh, sorry, comprehension open-ended passages are narratives stories, right? So there's always a plot. There's always a bit of a storyline, a story mountain, right? So after analyzing the text, later I'll show you how it's done, um, a, a brief demo. Can right? I just ask a quick quick question from, sure. from here? Yeah, because I think all these are very uh, great, good work and, they, and because they are all very deep. Yeah, uh, at the same time, I think uh, even in my ex experience of having taught kids to analyze a short problem sum, 
I can sense that uh, kids are, are struggling in between having to go through the fast way of solving it and getting the, the right answer versus, uh, versus slowing down like, 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 uh, like what you are saying and even to admit that they don't understand. So how do you uh, get a child to, to, to feel safe and is there any like, uh, like a pre, pre kind of work for the children to adjust their mindset before they start this whole flow? Mm, mm, yeah, good question. So to a new student, um, this might feel, wow, you know, I used to spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes of my time doing complete OE, which is too short, by the way. Um, now you're asking me to stretch this to 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Mm. So um, I would usually go through the questioning with them. So they know exactly what questions. Later during the demo, I'll show you, right? Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the so-called overall steps first. Sure. Um, so I will always go through the questions with them and we have a class discussion. And sometimes hearing other students um, reply uh, or give their point of view, uh, mix the engagement, makes the, stu makes the student realize, oh yeah, actually I could have asked that question too, right? So we start off by going through the entire passage together, I'll guide them. And then the following weeks when they're more confident, I will do half the passage, they will do the remaining half, but I will ask them, what questions did you ask yourself? Because the skill they're trying to learn is to learn how to ask, right? And then next time, when they do their own comprehension uh, on their own, then they would be able to just show me um, whatever they have annotated, right? So asking a question is the first step. Second step is to read the questions. Obviously, that one is important. Uh, later, I'll talk about the different types of questions. And then to read the passage again. Now, this time, they'll go back to the passage and they'll annotate and mark out the possible answers. So I always want them to be able to identify where the answers are within the context of the passage. So if they don't like to highlight, I think the neatest way is to just draw brackets because they, they might change their mind. So draw brackets and label question one, question two, and so on. And then after that, um, to answer the question, then they write down the answer, finally to check the answers. Okay, so how does critical uh, reading, uh, this all these taking uh, short pauses uh, mean in a classroom, right? So for example, this is the opening paragraph of a passage that I did with my students, right? So um, I'll quickly just read this, right? Because I think some context is important for us to appreciate the content, but I'll be real quick. So wait here, sweetheart, said Albert's mother, and I'll be done in a minute. Just hang out and have some fun. With that, she was gone. There was a lot wrong with these two sentences. For one thing, Albert was too old for his mother to be calling him sweetheart, especially in public. For another, he knew it would take a lot longer than a, than a minute for his mother to take care of the work she had to finish that night. It would take more than 15 minutes. It could take as long as 60 or 70 of them. But most importantly, there was simply no way he would have fun, not for 60 minutes, not alone in mother's office. So immediately there is some context. I'll ask the students what, what this passage is about. So what is this passage about? And the students will tell me, oh, it's about maybe Albert, right? It's about Albert waiting for his mother to finish work. It's about Albert going to his, his mother's office. It's about Albert um, not liking uh, to be called sweetheart and so on. So then I have a few, so different students will pick up different things in the passage, right? And then, oh, what, what is the setting of this story? So this is not very clear uh, in the text, but it is inferential. So I get students to, to pick up, um, maybe it is uh, where Albert's mother work, worked, right? Maybe it was uh, a, an office setting, right? So the last, the last part tells us that, right? Then how would you describe Albert? Now, from his reaction, his thoughts, we have a mental picture of this character. Um, then, of course, students will struggle to describe him. Then I'll just simply ask, do you like him? Well, if you can like or don't like, that's an opinion, right? And they're never wrong, right? So my favorite way to ask them a question is, uh, what do you think is the answer? Because the answer can be right or wrong, but what you think is never wrong. Because mm. you think it. So it's a very safe discussion. They can make wild guesses, right? Um, Some say, oh, maybe this will be a zombie story. You know, so... <laughs> Some of the cheeky ones will come up with a lot, but I like them to think like that out of the box. Yeah. So after this discussion, then we move on to the next chunk. And again, another student will read. Now I'm using this opportunity also to train their reading and um, also train their listening. Um, so I never get the, the student who is reading to answer these questions because when you're reading, you're using a very different function. You are doing, essentially you're performing. So your, your analytical skills may, may be a bit weakened when you're reading something. So it's those who are listening that, that I will ask them for their views. 
because then they are more attentive to the details, right? So they take turns to read and all that. So like I said, I'll go through the whole passage with them. Um, and then subsequently, they will have to do it themselves. So another part of um, John's question just now, which I want to, I waited for now to answer is um, I equip my students by building their stamina. My -hmm. passages are usually about two and a half to three pages long. Uh, PSLE is one page. Pages long. Three pages long, yeah. So, um, and occasionally I don't have 10 questions. I have 12, 15 questions. Um, The reason is this. uh, We train muscles and we we train our stamina by stretching, Uh by pushing ourselves. Yeah. So, um, I know that they will, they will, they will take longer to, to read if they really follow this technique closely. So I need them to be able to develop fluency. So after mastery, you develop fluency, right? After you understand, you can drill, right? So um, by giving them longer passages and getting them used to the length, um, that builds their stamina. So that's my intention uh, of building that stamina. Yeah. Then for students who just joined us recently who like, wow, cannot take the length. Uh, then doesn't matter. Then it take a bit longer, but just know that you know slowly you need to be able to build that capacity. It's all about capacity building when they come to us. So after reading the passage, sorry, can I just ask one more question? Uh, yeah, because uh, actually I like the parts and it just uh helped me to be more aware of the parts that uh when we read we don't analyze that much because we have to read it's like a performance. Yeah, mm. so I think it. It, it suddenly dawned on me that um, probably when I get my child to read, I don't ask her to explain right after that. Probably I will get her to read out loud, then read quietly. Then mm. I'll move on to the analysis, analysis part. Yeah. 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 So I thought You can just get them to read silently. I mean, if it's not an intentional oral lesson, mm. um, then just get them to read silently. I think it's fine. Um, and in fact, sometimes I like to model reading. So... It is also kind of um, modeling uh, for them. They hear, they hear you read. They know how it is read properly. So there are, it, it depends on the intention of the, ex- of the activity. Yeah. Say if they, if they mispronounce a word uh, or they do, not pro- they do not say it clearly, do you get them to, or just on a spot, or do you get them to finish reading the whole passage first, then you correct them? What's the best way or better way? Mm. I, I rarely correct my students' uh, mispronunciation, mm-hmm. uh, mispronunciation because I think um, I see their reading as a contribution and a gift. I don't want to put them off. Mm. Um, and I will always, unless, unless it is very off, yeah. so I only correct them when we are doing oral or um, for other instances. But for classroom reading, I just want them to enjoy the story Mm. And I want them to dive into the context. Um, so I very rarely do that. I do, I do. Occasionally I do. But I, I consciously try to stop myself. It's very hard, no? <laughs> <laughs> I try to stop myself. Um, because sometimes if I correct them, I may mm. trigger another student who may be insensitive and they may laugh. Uh. So I find that in some settings that is not, not desirable. So instead of um, on the spot, um, sometimes I would do that after so after we have talked about all the points in this slide for example then before I move on to the next slide I will, I will then go back to the word which was misread so it seems entirely not the person's fault you know ah. it, it's just uh, by the way this word is, should be um, uh, you know should be read in a certain way right so I correct them there with no attribution to whoever I think that's safer yes um, it doesn't you know put the child on the spot and they won't feel so embarrassed yeah, and gives them more confidence also because um, they, they know that the task is to, um, to understand and then their contribution is reading for the, for the rest of the students to, to be able to appreciate the story. Mm. Yeah, that's a great tip. Mm. Even for, for, for me as a, as a parent who, who teach my children this at home. Okay, can I move on? Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, good. Thanks. So now when we have finished reading the passage, um, then it is important to understand what the question is asking, right? So uh, I usually require them to look out for the number of marks. They are always aware that when there are two mark questions, there are two points that they need to, uh, you know, to include. Um, so I will get them to go back to the passage after reading the questions and then to highlight the relevant points. Yeah. Um, so 
when there is a whole question, now this is very basic. Um, by the time they reach P6, this this shouldn't uh, be a problem anymore. It's more for the um, ones and twos, and even nowadays P3, right? Because um, of the the change in the P1, P2 uh, syllabus. Um, so if it's a whole question and it's a person and so on and so forth, what is important is the why questions. They are usually implied and they are not in the text. Mm. So um, the students then need to be able to link a particular emotion with um, a particular action, right? So it's too fine grained to go into those details, but when you ask for a reaction, it must be an action. For example, he ran away is a reaction, but um, he... He felt sad, right? It's a feeling, right? So when he ran away, it was maybe, in, according to the context, it was fear. So how did he feel? Should be, uh, he was frightened. Cannot say he ran away because that was the reaction. So these fine-grained things, uh, like the differentiation between the reaction and feelings uh, can sometimes uh, stump uh, some students, right? Uh, but again, that's a matter of practice. I always advise them if they find, for example, they find a two-mark question, but in the passage gives them three points, they should include all three points. Because sometimes the marking scheme is such that if you have the first two points, you get one mark. And then if you have the third point, you get the, the full two marks. So always over-deliver. By the way, um, based on the trend of the past five, uh, four to five years of PSLE marking, uh, lifting used to be um, zero right away. But according to, I mean, I've been talking to some um, markers in the, in the previous few years, uh, lifting is allowed. It just must be contextualized to the question. Mm. Um, now, in the first place, lifting is not allowed. Let me tell you the logic of why lifting from comprehension is not allowed. Because a child with very neat handwriting can simply copy out the entire paragraph and put it into the, and get, get the teachers to look for the answers themselves. So, yeah. The child doesn't know the answer, just it's somewhere there, you know. So let me just write it in uh, and hopefully the teacher will be so kind as to just read and oh, once I see the points, I give you the two marks. Uh, that is not answering the question. So that is why lifting is not allowed. And um, if we explain this to the child, they will understand right away that they can't do it, right? But a lot of, a lot of teachers don't even know why lifting is not allowed. <laughs> okay, so, so in the first place, lifting needs to be contextualized. So nowadays, um, in the past few years, even when an answer completely lifts from the passage, um, it is now acceptable in the PSLE. I, I don't say it's for school because schools still may penalize. Mm. But this is something very new. The teachers may feel that let's train the students to use their own words uh, you know, instead of lifting. Lifting is a last resort. Mm. Uh, but the problem is sometimes the answer is so straightforward from the text. If you lift, if you try to use your own words, you, you might change the meaning. Um, so that backfires. So again, saying that caused panic. Uh, so don't worry. Uh, so if you lift, but it answers the question directly, it is safe. It is fine, right? And the 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 kind of general guide is that you shouldn't lift um, more than four to five words from a stretch. So try to change um, some part of it. You can even try to change the sentence structure, move the main clause to the front and the sub clause to the to the back or something like that, right? So that's for lifting. Um, so like I said, after the, the, the students are annotated, then they can, I mean, they've gone to the passage and they've annotated, then they can go back to answer the, the questions. Yeah. So uh, that is roughly what I uh, want to share with you about the approach. Um, and I want to spend some time talking about the, um, talking about the true false questions uh, with, with parents. So I need some time to open up this particular file and then I will uh, okay. Okay, for parents who are still online with us right now, um, if you have any question, feel free to post in the comments box in the Facebook page where the Facebook Live is sitting. Yeah, so uh, we can help help you right now. Okay, so this is the typical um, true-false question. Uh, there are a few sentences and then the, the child needs to um, identify if this is, decide if this is true or false and give a reason why, right? Now, Natty, the main character, did not think that 
the mass meeting was enjoyable. So basically, the long and short of it, this student, this child followed um, her mother to a math teacher's conference, right? Uh, and during the conference, uh, she had some responses to the meeting, right? So what I will usually tell the students to do for the true-false question is to cut the sentence into parts, okay? So usually it is people and action that can be cut into parts and also positive, negative can be cut into parts. So I can't annotate very well with my machine, with my laptop now. So I'm just going to highlight to show you that this is one part. You need so my student, help. Um, wait, can I? You can use a zoom. Do you have a pen with you like a... Yes, I, I do. So, yeah, but currently I can't write on it. Uh, never mind, it's okay. Because another thing, I, the reason I don't want to do this is it, I tried it before it crashed. So, <laughs> oh. I don't want my laptop to crash now. Um, so, if you need my help, I can do it for you. Yeah. Uh, never mind, it's okay. I, okay. I think don't need a scrap. So, this is one part. So, I'll get a student to, to draw a, a line here and then write one. And then did not think I would make it another part. So this is part two. Did not think what, right? That the math meeting, this is the object, right? Was enjoyable. So there are four parts. First part is netty. Second mm -hmm. part is did not think. Third part is that the math meeting and the fourth part was enjoyable. So they've already read the passage. They've already done the annotating. Now they need to decide, is there any part in this four that is untrue according to the context of the passage. So what they will then do is they will need to look back at the passage. Let me split screen so that you can see the passage also, right? So um, here we have, um, if you notice the passage is quite long. <laughs> okay, here yeah. you have the, the, the passage. Okay, so coming to the front part, right? So her mom had taken Nettie upstate to Hudson Valley for a big meeting, right? Nettie's mother was very popular, right? Nettie loves seeing. Mm. Then there is this part. So this is the clue that the students will need to use in the passage that will answer this question. The math meeting had been fun, but as the train rode them smoothly towards home, so they're going home after the meeting, Nettie felt glad it was over. Mm. So the students need to decide that which part is true, which part is false. So most students would make the mistake of thinking, oh, that means this is not true. They'll put a big X on top of was enjoyable because they say it was glad it was over. Mm -hmm. right? But they didn't catch the nuance of the meeting had been fun. Fun and enjoyable is going to be the same in the meaning, right? So this is in fact a true statement. Now actually, for true false questions, the true statements are very difficult to justify. The students don't know what to do. If it's false, they can easily put in the correct version, but true will stump them, right? So I always tell them it's as easy as taking the context within the statement and the passage and combine it to say the same thing. So I would say Natty felt that the meeting was fun. Nah, so you signal to the marker that you caught the context fun mm. right you can say she just felt that it was too long because for days right so um, the second part is um, just to demonstrate that you have read and understood the context the first sentence is to prove that this is true yeah so all they need to do is part, cut them and then, of course, um, to identify the, fault, the part that is false. So maybe I can remove the split and just show you the general length of this particular. By the way, this is a P5 uh, Compre passage. And you mentioned that uh, mm. the normal length is about two to three pages. Two to three. Yeah. So this is, but my, the font size is, of course, bigger than what the, the schools try to fit into one A4 page. Uh -huh. So this is one page, two pages, three. Yeah. So if we kind of squeeze this into the same font size, um, it's probably going to be about two and a half, uh, yeah. two and a half pages. Yeah. So this we will actually you know do together, and then uh, subsequently the students will annotate. I'll go through the annotation with them, um, and it is a team effort. So the students will learn the skill along the way, um, so that when they have to do it themselves, they at least have some practice. 
so by doing this, we, we kind of can get some consistency in the students getting 19 and 20 upon 20 for their comprehension. Because some people really don't believe, really can get full marks for comprehension OE. I think can. I've seen it happen. Uh, I've seen it happen a lot of times. Um, if they have the right motivation and the right techniques. Yeah, the only people who won't benefit from this are people who don't want to use it. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's always how much they are willing to invest, um, you know, the effort. Um, and if they want to see quick results, I will tell them right away, you, you won't see quick results. Nothing in life is, is uh, easy if you want, you know, to be, to, to, to be successful in your comprehension open-ended. You need to put in the effort. Um, and then, of course, the success stories will motivate them. Yeah. So, um, I pause for a while. Are there any questions? Mm, at the moment, there's no question for the parents. Uh, about 11 of them are watching in the Facebook page. Mm. Uh, okay. But I do have a question because I think uh, mm. I'm coming from parents who, who uh, teaches my kid and I am quite shocked. Like, there's so much stuff that I have to, to learn to, to be able to teach my kid. <laughs> yeah, uh, so... So, um, okay, what's the question that I want to ask? Yeah, so, okay, because even for math problem sums, probably um, they're not as long as what you see in the com comprehension. Yeah, but I realized that there are many kids out there uh, and their parents told us that their kids just refuse to underline or uh, mm -hmm. to annotate. Yeah, yep. so do you have such similar experience and how do you, and I call up the word that you say, uh, with the right uh, motivation. So how do you actually motivate a kid who just refuse to, to annotate at all? Mm. Okay. Can I check with these parents? Are any one of them currently parents of primary six students? Um, okay, let, just, let me do a shout out. Okay, parents uh, who are still uh, mm. online with us right now, thanks so much for being here. And if you have a P6 kid who doesn't underline or highlight keywords, uh, be in com comprehension or problem sums, uh, just type in me, bracket P6. So we know that you are here so that we can address it on the spot right now. So we'll wait for them to reply if there's any. Mm, okay. Yeah. So what, what, what if there is? Yeah, okay. So we're talking about motivation. Mm. Um, I, I, my belief is this, everyone can be motivated. It's just by what, right? I have students who may not be scoring well, but they're very motivated to play games. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everyone can be motivated and um, you would observe a certain change in P6 students. Um, P5 is the hardest year to teach because they are mature enough to absorb a lot of things, but they don't have the right motivation. Wow. So um, it doesn't help that they, 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 do, they do not have a mid-year exam coming also, right? I mean, usually you know, that was the, that's the plan. Um, I, I asked this about P6 parents, uh, P6 students, because by the time they reach P6, the motivation is very clear. It is the right moment to push them, but it's always too late. So that's the dilemma, right? Um, so I think um, what I share with my students at the beginning of the year is a goal setting. I always tell them they need three goals. They need a stretch goal, they need a realistic goal, and they need a minimum goal. So the stretch goal can be um, the top school that they want to go to, right? Without naming any school. So the, the stretch goal can be the top school. The realistic goal is where they are at now. Out of their four subjects, how much they are scoring, will they be able to get the T-score to get into that school, right? This year is still T-score. And then the minimum goal is what if something happens and they surprisingly, you know, get below 20 points of what they thought they would get. It happens, right? We know it happens. Um, so then what happens? Because I have students who are so heartbroken because they only think, oh, I only go to that one school and if they don't, any other school seems, you know, like a, a, a tragic loss, you know? So they need to have a minimum school where they can go into, which they know that they can get in. They look at the T-score from past years and they know that oh, this is near my house or my cousin goes to this school or I, I, I someone like this school because of certain whatever, you know, other reasons. So they need to have these three sort of goals, right? And then I have students um, who have um, set their goals on ASTA, right? So these are for the P6 uh, parents, right? Thanks parents for responding. Do you um, need to uh, magnify it because it's going to, yeah, yeah, because it's a long list. Wow. Now, so my parents asked me, no, actually my students asked me, Dr. Chua, I, I want to get A star. How many marks can I lose? <laughs> so um, I want to kind of go through this with our parents here because uh, we cannot visualize, right? I, I think my, my child can do this. Huh? I think we can do that. Okay, so 
we're talking about a student who is aiming for A star, right? And this is actually with not a lot of buffer, so it's ninety two percent, just A star. But of course, after moderation, ninety two percent can be very comfortable in A star. So essentially, upon a base out of a base score of two hundred, you need to only be able to lose sixteen marks. Where can you take these sixteen marks away from, right? So let's go back to the top. Paper one is compo, situational, fifteen. You must lose zero marks. It is possible. And compo, 35. Now, for students who cannot score more than 35 for compo, I will tell them, don't aim A star. <laughs> mm. Okay, because it's going to be a very difficult thing to do. Right? Why? Because if you can hit above 35, then, then, you are, then you are in the game. Right? If you are not yet in the game, uh, at this point, 51 days left, I think, or 50, 49 days left mm. to PSLE English paper. Um, I, I think uh, if you can't hit 35 and above, then you better make sure the other parts can pull up. Then book, paper two is your booklet A, that 28 MCQ. Out of the 28 MCQ, you can only lose two marks, which means that your grammar is perfect. Your visual text comprehension is perfect. Now your vocabulary, now vocabulary is the part that the schools can calibrate the difficulty of the paper. I just throw in set one word. On, I mean, it's confirmed that the P6s will struggle, right? So <laughs> vocabulary is the part that usually the setter of the school or even SEAB for PSLE, they can sort of you know, bully the kids. So vocabulary, they need, can only make two mistakes. And they cannot make any mistakes in grammar and cannot make mistakes in VTC, right? And then for booklet B, 62 out of 67. All right, now where can they lose these five marks? So I break it down for them. These are the, uh, these are the, uh, sorry, I highlight in green so that you can differentiate. These are the paper two, the booklet B components, right? So for grammar close, 10 out of 10, right? Editing, maybe one mistake because maybe that word you've never seen before don't know how to spell, right? Uh, Compre close, well, maybe two of the questions you accidentally find the wrong context, so 13. SNT, perfect because grammar can be mastered, can be learned, right? Mm. Or, or Compre OE, we've just talked about, let's say you accidentally, you know, miss a point or two, 18 marks. So then you get your 62 upon 67. So overall for paper two, you should get 88 out of 95 uh, around there. Paper three is listening comprehension. Maybe you make one mistake, 19, right? Most of the time, the students can get 18 to 20 quite comfortably. Mm. And for paper four oral, reading, you can read very well, but that day maybe you misread a word because you were too anxious. So maybe one mark deducted. Then you're, you get what I mean, right? Yeah, first then, scenarios. Then, so I am <laughs> giving the student a mental picture of what an A star looks like for English. Yeah. So it's near perfect. And the others can be practiced train and practice, but there is one part, which is this part, which I always tell them, if you don't have 35 marks and above, um, a bit hard. So the flip side of this is my students who have 35 marks and above or compo, aim for A star. Mm. It can be done. Yeah. And, do, you uh, have, do, you, do you have case, case cases? Because I, and I, and I think that uh, we, we hope that all the children get as high as possible. Mm. But do you have case, cases that, that you know that this kid is, wouldn't be able to reach a star because of the marks breakdown. But when we say that, oh, maybe the kid can aim for A, and then you face us uh, like back, backlash from the parents say that, hey, why you don't believe my kid? Or maybe the kid get discouraged. Mm, yeah. Um, I, I have conferences with parents before, I mean, discussions with them, telling them that I think I'm aiming in my heart, your child is a maximum 80 marks. But that's because currently they are getting 60. Ah. So they know their child, they know their child better than me. Um, it is not not common that we find a parent who has a child who is not in the in the range, right? Trying to aim for the A star. It's it's not something that we can tell them. Uh, you know, we we, I mean, I, I don't think you would overpromise uh, your parent if you look at the child who needs a lot of um, you know really have to almost transform the way they think. Um, I think realistically, they they know where they are at. And, um, but strangely, my expectations of their own children are higher than their own, <laughs> most mm. of the time, most of the time. So those who come in with um, A-star, who, who have expectations for an A-star, uh, usually are already quite strong. So all I need to do is just to make sure that they don't, you know, make any mistakes and uh, kick their bad habits and to um, fine tune, um, especially in terms of the way they think about certain portions. Um, so... I think in terms of matching parents' expectations, uh, it's always a matter of communication. Uh, we also want to tell them it, at the initial stage, you know, if 
they show me the when during the diagnostic stage, you know, when they come in for like a, a trial lesson, right? So we see their papers and we can make assessment on where they are at. Um, so especially when the P6 and we have three months runway, then I think we will just be realistic. There are certain things that I think your child has potential to push. So um, easily we can add another, you know, 10, 15 marks. But if grammar is, uh, is a problem or if reading is a problem, they don't read and they don't understand what they're reading, that, that's going to be very tough. But still, I would want to help them. Uh, mm. It's just to manage their expectations. And they are, they are also aware uh, of what they are aiming for. Mm. Wonderful. Yes. What about kids who... Um, okay, because I... And I, and I realised that to, to do that for English, you also require a lot of, of, of reading uh, mm. at their own time. Uh, yes. What about for kids who don't like to read? Mm, yeah. Mm. So how how can we we parents encourage them to read more at home? Yeah, I I I, I get what where you're coming from. There are a lot of students who really don't read, and um, the challenge is we have in mind parents have in mind a certain types of certain types of books that are good for them and types of books that are not good for them. Um, my own experience is I like to read things that I'm interested in. I think we all do. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the topic is actually quite important. Uh, getting them to have a have an interest and then um, to to focus on their interest even when they're reading for more information. So, I I think some parents see it as a compromise, but I see it more as um, a way to balance. Uh, I can I can um, usually allow some of my students to read graphic novels, yeah. Mm -hmm. But some parents say no. Uh, so every parent needs to. Um, decide what their boundaries are. For mm -hmm. me, if you can start reading, right, get familiar with the book, handle the book, right, and then uh, you know slowly after graphic novels, maybe you do something easier. Uh, there's this series Geronimo, Geronimo Stilton. Um, some parents do, you know greatly dislike it, um, but I find that it's a good start. Subsequently, then they move towards Harry Potter, right? <laughs> so or, or certain other chapter books. Yeah. Um, as long as they are they are able to. Um, enjoy books, enjoy reading. I think um, that is something which all parents want to work towards. Um, if we become too narrow in what they can read, then they will associate reading with something which is boring to them and they will just not want to read, right? Especially next, um, I mean, especially secondary school, a lot of reading is involved. Um, if they don't like to read, then that is a, that's a problem. And uh, one of the things I think we're very happy about is that because we put newspaper reading as um, part of our program. So we basically allow students, I mean, we have a, we have a Straits Times account. So all of our students can go in and, and read newspapers. Um, but during the lessons, what we do is we will, we will read to them. Uh, we'll read with them, sorry. Actually, they're doing most of the reading. I'm just introducing them to ideas in the newspapers, make the newspapers sound more interesting to them. And yeah, then a lot of them start to read the newspapers. Um, so just now, right, I shared this uh, comprehension passage. So typically, we start with, we actually don't start with comprehension right away. So this is the netty thing, right? Mm. The passage. So typically, we start with a, comp with a passage. So we'll start with a discussion uh, to activate their, their thinking, activate their ideas, right? What you consider as failure and all that. And then we'll read this article, how a fear of failure taught me how to fail, right? So it's, what is this? Failure taught me how to fail. So there's a play with words. Mm -hmm. So then we'll read it together. And um, as we are reading, we are also um, able to um, teach them new words. So the, the vocab is there. And we are also able to um, get them interested in these ideas that are being talked about in the newspapers. Because if they see it as a very bland um, you know, um, article, they, they won't be interested. Right? But if they uh, are able to appreciate that uh, it is something which they can be engaged in, they will be quite interested. So I will show you the article. Uh, through a screen share. Do you okay. do you set set the bound boundary of articles uh, that the children can read, or it can be anything that that interests them? I just don't want to put in very very um scary crimes and all that. I think not all of them can take it. Uh, mm. um, my aim is to give them talking points during oral ah. because they run out of ammunition very quickly because they don't read newspapers. Mm. So this is so I had I for example I just want to show you the vocab side of it. So let's say conscientiously, right? So 
Um, so this is from the Straits Times. You know that ooh, Straits Times is boring, but you know if I read this and it's quite interesting. And then I've got um, the meaning of words, right? So this one is for my upper primary, right? Actually, mm -hmm. no, this one is for my P3 to P6. So even the P3s, I will have to explain some words to them, right? And then these are the key points um, that I want them to put into the worksheet. So just now I mentioned the five levels of critical reading, right? The, the arrow. Um, so the second level is identifying main ideas. So this is the main idea of this passage, right? So, so by going through um, the newspapers with them, I developed the love of reading the newspapers. And then um, by going through the passages with them in comprehension, um, they would, I'll develop the, the, the kind of interest in reading. So there, there's quite a lot of ways that we try to, to put in. Um, of course, some parents also think that um, reading and writing are separate functions. I think that's not very true because from the comprehension passages, I can tell them, look, how well this author, this author has described the characters, use it in your compo. So I want you to highlight this and then use it in your compo. So compo and uh, compri work hand in hand. Um, if you can appreciate what you're reading, you can apply that into your writing. Um, and the, the newspaper articles give them ideas uh, for what to write in their comp compositions as well. Because I cover topics like um, crime, traffic accidents, so if they write about traffic accident, but they don't know how to describe a traffic accident, there's a newspaper report detailing exactly what happened, right? Mm -hmm. uh, accelerator, braked, and all these kind of words, right? They may not be familiar with. They only know how to start, stop. <laughs> so um, then um, environment, especially, um, you know, this week we talked about Pulau Samakau, about landfill. So um, if we can't in incinerate the three streams of waste, packaging waste, food waste, and electronic waste, right? So all these things we go through, through the newspapers, um, so that during oral, they, they will not always keep talking about the same old things, like you know, collect newspapers, weigh them, recycle them. Then they can talk about uh, food waste, compost. Uh, some restaurants collect a lot of uh, food waste so that they can um, reprocess, sell it as fertilizers. Right? Mm -hmm. So these are interesting things. Um, so we spend about maybe the first 15 to 20 minutes of the lesson um, going through the articles. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that, that gives them uh, uh, of course, they also like to talk about the interesting things like, you know, um, why is why does America want to ban TikTok? <laughs> that kind of thing. So yeah, because yeah, I have my, my background in politics and history, so I love talking about this, but I can get carried away. Um, so, <laughs> so I think it's um, engagement. Um, they need to associate reading with interesting things. Um, then they can, they can find reason because everyone can be motivated. It's um, how and uh, what they want to go for. Mm. Great. Yeah. And, and for the past one hour, and I heard that uh, you really want the kids to, to do well uh, for, the, for the test as well, also to, to like to learn. Yeah. Mm. And at the same time, uh, because, and I realized that uh, even for, for, for myself, even though I'm someone who loves to read, and I also have friends who don't read at all. So how, uh, what, what will you tell to, 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 to parents who don't read, yeah, and yet they want their children to read? Um, it's tough because a yeah. lot of what students, children do depend um, on parents. They, we, we role model a lot of things for them. If we're always swiping on the phone, they'll be swiping on the phone. Right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, some, it's a decision um, to set aside time. If it is a structured time, that, that can be a good start. Uh, if, we, if we ourselves know that this, this is a struggle for us, so I think we can afford to be more understanding uh, towards our children. So maybe there can be a structured time to be together. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I mentioned I homeschool, and that's what uh, my wife does with uh, my children. So we will sit down at, you know, at the sofa and just read chapters together. Mm. So um, it's just a daily practice um, to read. And after that, read the chapter together, take turns to read paragraphs. Right? I do that with my kids when we are doing Chinese. So um, it is basically to help them in their pronunciation at a very formative age. Um, and if they like to interact with the books, um, they like their pictures. You know, sometimes some young kids, they may not read the book, they may not be able to read yet, but they just like to pretend to read. Yeah. So that's a very good, <laughs> that's a very good start. They associate that with, uh, with reading, um, uh, with reading with, um, you know, their interest or something which they want to, to, to know how to do better. Um, so, 
for parents, I, I believe now we are moving away from, uh, from reading books per se. Uh, the way we consume information is now through shorter um, passages, uh, articles. May not be a tweet. I think tweet is still too short. I think a lot of us like to read um, posts, right? Could be social media posts, could be um, newspaper articles, right? May not be books. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but see reading not as an end in itself, but as a, a way towards um, discovery, towards learning and mm -hmm. developing an interest, developing a skill. And I think then it makes reading a lot more enjoyable. Yeah. Great. That's a nice wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to add on? Uh, um, I think just covering today's topic, I think that's that's all I, I have planned. Um, but again, yeah, we'll see if we, have, we can do this again. <laughs> Lots of tips and tricks uh, that you shared and probably I'm going to steal some from you. <laughs> Welcome. And, and, and at home. Yeah, because I think um, I love to read and thank, thank goodness my elders like to read as well. Uh, but I think the, the, the next step for me is to really sit down with her and to analyze it and to and to discuss together. Mm, mm. Uh, that will be quite fun for both of us. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Great. Okay. Okay, so okay, one last question that I always ask my guests uh, right mm. now, um, because we know that the primary sixers are getting stressed out and, and, and because you also have your own P6 class, mm. probably can also sense their anxiety. Yep. Yeah. So um so if I may invite you to walk down with me um, uh, down your memory lane, and then you 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 walk down to the young younger self, and you met the twelve year old Daniel, mm. and he's so close to you that he's looking at you, and you can almost touch him, la. Yeah. So what will you tell him? Before PSLE, uh, it can be anything. Mm. What will you first say to him? That's I think I'll ask you to right. study a little bit more. <laughs> you should be able to elaborate on that. I, I, I didn't go through a very uh, rigorous education system. So because I was from Hua Xiao, you know, um, and then even my secondary school was Hua Xiao. Chinese school. So yeah, I was from Chinese medium schools and, um, you know, I recited a pledge in Chinese every day and all that. So um, for me, I, I feel that my parents were very enlightened in the sense that they, they see my potential and they let me achieve whatever I can. I never felt that I was not good enough putting in my, my average you know, effort. Um, I, I didn't felt that, I didn't feel I struggled. Um, unlike some of the students that I currently interact with, they, they have expectations uh, put on them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I... But then later on in life, when I look back, I feel that maybe if I had um, pushed a bit harder, um, then maybe I've gone a little bit uh, differently. I've done some things a bit differently. Um, but I, I, I really enjoyed my growing up years. Um, it was a lot of uh, friendships and games. Um, in the midst of learning, yes. But then, you know, we, I think I, I remember those moments more. Right, playing with my friends, playing hopscotch, uh, and you know, playing rounders, uh, more than uh, studying or, or doing assessment books. Uh, but I might want to advise myself to perhaps work a little bit, uh, spend a little more time working, uh, practicing and uh, trying to you know score a bit better. Although I don't think I'm worse off. Um, it's just a different journey. Yeah. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you, Karim. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and and uh, thanks thanks for the really the 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 great tips that you have shared. Yeah, because okay. I think those are things that works. Uh, even uh, that can also help many parents out there, who are trying to figure out how to help their kids. Mm. Mm. Okay, welcome. Okay, Daniel. Uh, okay, parents. Uh, thanks so much for being here. And so, if you have just joined us, uh, you can always catch the replay in the Facebook Live. And we have uh, Mami uh, Don, uh, she was sharing. Thank you, Dr. Chua. You're welcome. Okay, great. Okay, don't go out first. I'll start the Facebook Live and then we'll just do a quick catch up. Yeah. Sure, sure. Bye, yeah. my parents. Have a good lunch. Thank you. See you.